Thanks, Keish. And um, just a couple of uh, uh, thoughts to start off with. Um, in 1985, when I was a first year houseman in Dunedin, New Zealand, I actually understood how much blood there is in a human body because a young Maori chap who hadn't been taking his anti tuberculous drugs cavitated into a main pulmonary artery and lost his blood volume on the floor. It was quite spectacular trying to resuscitate him. Clearly, it was a failure. Um, so I have, I, I have seen TB in action. Um, and many of the issues about access to drugs are particularly pertinent in pregnancy. There is a, a, an incredibly effective agent to reduce the occurrence and the mortality rate associated with the, the, the grand mal seizures of eclampsia. It's Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate, and trying to find manufacturers who are willing to produce Epsom salts in an intravenous solution or intramuscular formulation to get it into the hands of caregivers in the low and middle income world is phenomenally difficult. And it's been, a, it's been a challenge for many of us in this area. So why is it important that we think about reducing maternal mortality? Of the Millennium Development Goals, it is the one that the global community is addressing least well. We are supposed to, by 2015, reduce the rate of maternal mortality by 75%. At the moment, in many countries, the rate is static. In very few countries has the rate actually fallen. Over the last five years, there does appear to be a shift, but the data upon which those estimates are is based um, are, are deeply flawed, and it's a problem. So why am I particularly interested in a condition called preeclampsia, which is hypertension and the loss of protein in your urine, classically? Um, it's because it's the second leading cause of maternal mortality in the world. About 76,000 women die annually from it, we believe, but that's probably an underestimate. Um, and that's one death every seven minutes, not one death every 15 seconds from TB. Um, but it's the equivalent of an Airbus 321 crashing every day. And most people haven't heard of it. And that's a problem for us in the community is that we can't get people engaged in this topic. Thankfully, the Gates Foundation has come to the party. About half a million babies are lost a year. Oh, there are still births and neonatal deaths as a consequence. And over 99% of those deaths occur primarily in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is the classical view of maternal mortality. If you're a demographer, you know, if you live in New Zealand, where I'm from originally, um, or in the US or Canada or Europe, I mean, generally life looks pretty good. And these, the, the hotter and darker the colors become, the, the, the more miserable the, the circumstances. So if you're born in that little black spot there, because there aren't any data coming from Afghanistan at the moment, um, and you're born a girl, you have a one in seven lifetime risk of dying because you've been pregnant. And those women who are dying are teenagers and women in their 20s and at, at the worst, at the latest, 30s. I've now cracked 50 over a year ago. I mean, they're hellishly young women from my perspective. So this is the woman's view of her risk because this is where the women who are dying live. And it's a completely different, um, disproportionate um, a view of the world, and apart from the United States, which has startlingly high maternal mortality um, uh, outcomes because of the way that they don't provide um, health care, um, it's really an inverse relationship to GDP. But it's also, if you have conflict, this is a, a problem again. Conflict drives this equation as well. So for preeclampsia, in, in low middle income countries, women die from the grand mal seizures of what we call eclampsia, which is sort of an end stage of the process. They die from strokes because they are severely hypertensive and they just blow their circle of Willis and the base of their brain apart. They bleed behind the placenta or they develop an intravascular coagulopathy so that they just lose the ability to control their hemostatic system their kidneys fail, and they have this systemic inflammatory response, which is actually what I study in my wet lab when I'm not doing clinical research, is this piece of it, because that's what drives this maternal syndrome, which is across a whole series of vulnerable organ systems. So classically, it's hypertension and proteinuria. That's how we define it. That's how we generally diagnose it. But it's a systemic condition, and it's a systemic disease that, that may kill you. 
And why do women die, whether it's from preeclampsia or for postpartum hemorrhage, which is number one in, in the world in terms of maternal mortality, and that's the other way you can see uh, the person's blood volume on the floor very rapidly, I, uh, um, I can tell you. Um, is delays, they're called the three delays. And the delays in triage, so that's case identification and severity um, identification, and that can be from caregivers or it can be patient factors, um, so the woman doesn't present, or it can be family or societal factors. So if a woman in some villages in Pakistan, for example, if she starts to bleed out with a postpartum hemorrhage, if, da if the husband isn't home or her mother-in-law isn't at home, she can't leave the home. So she's going to die. It's a, it's, in a, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a completely linear relationship. Um, and then the problems with um, triage at the health center level and then at the inpatient facility level. The problems around transport. I mean, <coughs> SOGC, which is the Canadian Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, is actually developing a system of bicycle ambulances for peri-urban Kampala so that women can get into care. It's just a simple solution because sometimes women are literally days away from having access to care. And then treatment. Do we have effective disease-modifying interventions to offer? Are they cost-effective either to produce or to buy, depending on what side of the paradigm you're on? Um, and are they av available? So magnesium will often be in stock out. So, you know, yeah, yeah, well, I, I'm supposed to have magnesium, but today I don't. So what am I going to use? So um, as Keisha um, said, we um, <coughs> recently supported um, seven million, uh, re received $7 million worth of support from the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which was um, a, a shock to receive the initial phone call and invitation. But I must confess, when they said, are you interested in doing this work, um, I did say yes. Um, <laughs> Um, and it's a, it's a four-year umbrella gr grant that's going to cover five components which are now all up and running because we've had the money for about four months um, where we're starting to spend it. It's good to be able to spend money, especially given how CIHR is behaving at the moment. So the, the, this is the sort of the framework of the organization and the five projects around prevention, monitoring, and treatment. So preempt is preeclampsia, eclampsia, monitoring, prevention, and treatment because the acronym works better that way. Um, but those are the three sort of intervention pieces. There's a collaboratory, and you, uh, people have been talking about getting like-minded individuals to work as consortia. This is to develop a, an international preeclampsia consortium. We're developing um, web tools so that we can send data between data sets and develop a, a virtual biobank internationally. And then there's a KT piece that we're doing with the WHO. So I'll just quickly run through each of these projects to give you a sense of what, of what this is like. So the first piece is, a, um, is about giving calcium to women in pregnancy. So the, the data around calcium supplementation in populations who are not calcium replete, so that's your four servings of dairy a day, imply that if, you, if women randomized in low calcium intake um, settings have a 30% reduction in risk for developing proteinuric gestational hypertension, so pregnancy hypertension, preeclampsia. However, if you are calcium deficient, so all these data and apparent effect derive from low calcium intake populations. However, if you look at the calcium deficient populations, whether you're male or female, if you take calcium, you're actually taking an antihypertensive by about two and a half millimeters of mercury. But that's important when the primary outcome of the trial is hypertension. So if you arbitrarily drop the blood pressure of one half of your population by two and a half millimeters of mercury, those women may still be proteinuric, but they won't have hypertension any longer, and they may still be vulnerable to the adverse events that cluster around that diagnosis. So it's important that we address this particular question, which is why some people are still hesitant to, to recommend calcium supplements in women who have low calcium intake. In my own clinical practice, today I do, because I think it's a safe thing to do. You can chew a Tums a day, and, and that also helps the heartburn of pregnancy, but it's, it's, it's a sort of safe, effective sort of intervention at that level, but um, I'm not sure I'm actually preventing preeclampsia or its consequences at this point. 
So what Justice Hofmeyer, who was the guy who actually coordinates the, um, the Reproductive Health Library, if anyone's aware of that, which is an open access form of the Cochrane collaboration around reproductive health. He's in East London and South Africa. It's a placebo controlled trial. It'll be occurring in South Africa and Zimbabwe, and part of the team's just come back from there. Um, and it's about women who have previously had preeclampsia, or it's, and especially those who have had um, perinatal losses. So they've had either a stillbirth or a neonatal death. And so the, this is where it will be occurring in um, uh, Joburg, East London, and Cape Town um, at University of Cape Town. Uh, we've got another project going with uh, Stellenbosch as well, and Harare in, in Zimbabwe. So both arms of the trial will receive calcium from 20 weeks. So it gets rid of that epiphenomenon of lowering the blood pressure. But what will happen is that women will be randomized to calcium or not pre-pregnancy. So they'll be identified after their first index pregnancy. They're known to be planning a second pregnancy or a subsequent pregnancy, and they will be randomized to calcium or not. And then women will be followed through pregnancy, and we've made all sorts of assumptions, and we've done a power calculation, all this stuff you're supposed to do. Uh, and, and at this stage, we're only really powered to determine whether or not we reduce the incidence of preeclampsia. And I still have a bit of a problem with that, because as a species, we've lived with preeclampsia as long as we've had a written history. So the third papyrus from ancient Egypt and ancient Chinese scrolls talk about women dying from, apparently from the seizures of eclampsia. So we've had it for millennia, and we're the only species that we're certain develops this condition. And, but we're the, also the only uniformly bipedal species. So as we, if you're a pregnant woman, and as you move from one clump of bush to the next clump of bush, you're diverting blood away from your uterus into the two biggest mu muscle groups in your body, which are your thighs and your buttocks. And that may actually reduce fetal um, oxygenation and, and blood supply through the placenta, and therefore a moderate elevation of blood pressure may be actually protective, and that may be the selection pressure for us having preeclampsia as a biological response. So I'm not completely convinced that this is the right primary outcome, but this is really a pilot trial to see if we can have some effect, and then we would have to have an adequately powered trial to see whether or not it actually reduces the adverse events that cluster around a diagnosis. Actually, what we're planning to do with the calcium work. The, the, um, the, the second study within the um, collaboratory is actually one that's UBC derived, and um, which is called Mini Peers. So what we've been in the process of doing is developing an outcome prediction model for women with preeclampsia. So one of the holy grails in obstetrics is the ability to, at early in pregnancy, to identify women at risk for preeclampsia. We're interested in that work as well. But primarily, this is once you have the diagnosis, can we identify the woman for who is at personal risk for the complications of preeclampsia as against the woman who's going to have a relatively benign course and just trundle through the remainder of her pregnancy? And over the last eight years, we've been sort of working on this primarily with um, CIHR funding. And, um, and a bit from the WHO and Rockefeller Foundation and, and other partners as well. And the, we've actually developed and va internally validated a full peers model, which is based on symptom signs and laboratory tests. But at the same time, we've been interested in de developing a version of the model that requires no laboratory tests, so it'd be purely symptom and sign based, which could be then applied by community health workers in villages in, in developing countries so that they can identify women earlier in the process and get them transferred into care. So that work will be happening, and I'm, I'm just back from one trip to Pakistan um, and, and um, Kenya and Ethiopia are related, but the Pakistan's where some of that work's gonna happen. About to leave to go to Fiji and China to do some more of it, and then it's also gonna be in Mali, Uganda, um, and, and um, in South Africa. So that, that work is going to be about a data set of about 3,000 women admitted to hospital in lower middle income countries with preeclampsia. The data from those women will also inform whether or not the, the model that also has the um, laboratory tests associated with it is actually effective in the academic or referral centers in low and middle income countries as well, because that, that will prov provide um, 
an external yeah, data set. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just push down on there. Thanks. Sorry. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so the idea, so especially if you're remote from term, if you develop preeclampsia, so let's say before 34 weeks, um, it's important to try to maintain the pregnancy for as long as it is safe to do so because the babies do better. They tend to not grow, but they end up being born healthier and more likely to survive. So, but we have to identify the women for whom that's safe because the maternal priority is to be delivered because that's the safest thing to do, mum, because the disease process won't go away until the placenta is delivered. Best to have the baby out first. Um, whereas the fetal priority is to maintain the pregnancy. There's this biological co conflict between mum and the baby, and you therefore have to try to pay that off play that off, and if you can identify maternal risk, it becomes easier to do, and historically we've not been good, able to do that. So as I said, we've just published this model in, in the Lancet, and um, with six um, biological variables, gestational age, so the longer you are pregnant, the better it is for you to have preeclampsia. The risk reduces with increasing gestational age. So if you develop preeclampsia before 32 weeks, you're 20-fold more likely to die from it, than if you develop it after 37 weeks of a 40-week pregnancy. Chest pain, dyspnea, so shortness of breath. Oxygen saturations on a, on, a, on a finger. It's an interesting story, but I didn't have time to talk about it. A platelet count, creatinine and AST in the maternal circulation. We've got an area under the rock curve of about 0.9, which is um, good, sort of well above the industry standard for this. And when you look at the stratification table, the column on the, the left here, um, that's just under 1%, and we're under 1%. This is up to 2.5%, 2, 3. I mean, these all work. So it's similar performance that you get from the Apache score for adult ICU or something like the Framingham score for cardiovascular risk pr um, prediction. So we're happy with that. So we want to move on to these other models, uh, this, uh, these other two models, one of which is mini pairs, and that's the priority and a sort of a generalizable model which will maybe have one laboratory test that's done very low in the healthcare system um, to make it as accessible as possible. So this is where it's happening, and it's happening across the globe as much as we can manage, um, and partly because I think Vancouver and Canada have forgotten that Canada is a Pacific Basin country. And if we look southwest into the Pacific, there's a huge population of women scattered across um, millions of square kilometers of ocean who need care and help. So that's part of the reason why I'm doing it. And um, we're doing this work in Suva and Fiji as well. It's also because I'm a Kiwi, so I grew up in the other corner of the Pacific from Vancouver, diametrically opposite. <coughs> so what we will do is we'll use standardized assessment and surveillance We'll look at various outcomes, and at the moment with, with about 340 data po points in the data set, it looks as though we've got an area under the rock curve for mini, a mini pairs model that's purely symptom and sign based of about 0.8, which would mean that it's it should become an effective model. So what we want to do with that model once we're finished with it is then work into um, the CLIP project, which is community level interventions for preeclampsia, which is a particular focus for the foundation. And what we want to do is task shift and get effective interventions into the hands of community health workers where the women are. So I was in Pakistan three weeks ago and we went out into a village and there was this tiny, tiny woman who was this community health worker. So she's got no formal education. She's been through a, a year's training process and she's responsible for immunizations and various other activities within the, uh, within the community. And she'd been taught about preeclampsia, but she didn't have a blood pressure cuff, for example. But she knew what she was talking about. And the women of the village all wore their best outfits because we were turning up for the day. It was quite a remarkable experience. So what we want to do is get over the first delay in terms of triage by uni u giving the community health workers a version of the mini pairs model that will help them case identify and risk stratify. We then want to intervene if the blood pressure is high, really high, um, with an oral antihypertensive to start bringing the blood pressure down uh, and intramuscular magnesium because it has to be given either intramuscularly and intravenously and community health workers won't have the latter skill set. If women have seized, we'll give them magnesium. And it's five grams in each buttock. 
You don't want to be awake when you get that. Um, it's apparently singularly painful. Um, some women would decline the second intervention. Um, and then they, they will be transferred in, into facilities offering evidence-based care. If they hit a primary health unit first, they wouldn't get the repeat intervention. They're just transferred on because we, magnesium has the potential to stop you breathing if you get too much of it. So the feasibility work for this trial um, will occur in Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda. And then we hope to, um, so that, and that'll be talking, working out whether it's feasible and acceptable to these communities of care and also the communities themselves and other NGOs and other partners in these different countries. Part of what we're gonna have to do to start off with to, to, to derive a sample size calculation for a definitive trial is actually work, what the vi work out what the vital stats are on these communities because births and deaths are often not registered, especially when they happen to women and girls. So this is where this activity is going to occur. And the reason we're gonna start our pilot trial work in p rural Pakistan and you, know, you literally you have to get war zone insurance to go to Pakistan currently. The insurance broker said it's okay, the premium would be a lot higher if you went to Afghanistan, it was really reassuring. Um, is that Zulfi Bhutta, who's actually presented at, at UBC on a number of occasions, um, has re recently shown that you can reduce the rate of stillbirth using community health workers as your intervention. There are an effective pop group of motivated local women who are intelligent and they just want to get, a, get things better for their own home communities. So we will do a pilot cluster RCT in Sindh province in Pakistan, um, and this is the reason why, and um, it'll be in um, two parts of uh, the Sindh province around, sorry, Hyderabad here and Matiari, so um, Karachi's here, it's about a three hour, two to three hour drive to get up to the field site. The population of interest will be um, pregnant women in their communities, and so these are the communities, and we'll be tracking in um, about 11,000 pregnancies across the, uh, across the two communities to, to do this. Um, and the intervention will be the, the package of care, the control clusters will receive whatever's happening today, which is diddly squat in the communities. Um, and then we will offer um, the primary outcome for the pilot trial will be the utilization of the package, and then we'll collect patient level data. And that's gonna take us four years. At the moment we're here, and we're still going through all the um, startup and setup processes. Um, at the moment, um, and we're doing, and then the feasibility work will happen in all the other countries other than Pakistan because they actually already have the data we need to get started. So they've got a head start so we can do the pilot trial there while we're doing the feasibility work in the other countries and work out a, a definitive trial. Sorry, and I'll just quickly race through the last couple of pieces. Um, the collaboratory, as I mentioned, is actually being led by Jim Roberts who established the McGee Women's Research Institute in Pittsburgh in, in, in Pennsylvania with Roberta Ness, who's a perinatal epidemiologist um, down, now down in Houston and Texas, and Chris Redman, who was my DPhil supervisor in Oxford. And what we want to do is create a virtual database related to the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and a virtual biobank. And so that partners within this collaboratory will, sh will for any given project, ch choose or not to share their data or biological samples or biological data, so it may be clinical or biological data, um, in a collaborative manner. <clears throat> and the foundation's really interested in this because they want to do this across the whole of obstetrics, but they're going to use us as their test tube to see whether or not it can be pulled off. It has been shown to work in both prostate cancer and breast cancer research in the past. And the outcome should be accelerated discovery and um, sh sharing of data and, and, and accelerating with other groups internationally who are interested in the same thing. And the final piece is that we're helping to fund and will participate in updating the current WHI guideline, WHO guidelines around the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Because when you go into Kenya, for example, they are following a guideline that's now about eight years old. There's been a lot of new knowledge in those eight years, but because that's the WHO guideline, they aren't moving their practice until the guideline's up updated. So we have to help facilitate that process. 
and the process itself will be a research priority generating um, exercise because you realize where the today's knowledge gaps are and which are the easiest to cross off the list. So that's the sort of the concept of what we're at. <clears throat> um, and what we hope is that we will end up reducing the burden of life-ending, life-altering, and life-threatening complications that, to my mind, make preeclampsia so important, even if it's under um, investigated in, in internationally. And there are a whole bundle of people who do need to be um, thanked around this, but in particular, the Gates Foundation. The leading cause of maternal mortality is PPH. They spent the first five years of Melinda Gates' initiative around reducing maternal mortality, addressing PPH. They then looked on the number two on the list, and it was preeclampsia. And now they've started addressing that. And sepsis on, and unsafe abortion will probably be number three, I suspect, because they're just taking a logical approach to it, for which I believe they should be commended. Thank you very much. Thank you.